Okay, everybody, welcome to class. Happy Friday. Happy day after Halloween. People still hyped up on sugar, apparently. Much to discuss. Okay, our learning objectives for today are the following. We've been hinting towards this all semester long. We finally got there. Diffusion. The fact that atoms don't stay put in their lattice. They move around a little bit. And this chapter describes how that happens. So the first thing is we'll talk about why these are useful in engineering applications. We're then going to describe atomic motion and introduce the equations that govern rates of diffusion from a practical standpoint. We'll introduce the idea of an activation energy and how that changes things. Um, we'll talk about vacancy versus interstitial. And finally, we'll get to the most important part, which is using fixed first and second laws to describe diffusion. Fixed first laws for steady state, fixed second laws for non-steady state. And I'll describe what that means. So uh, diffusion's all around us. You've seen it if you've seen things corroding. They, they typically corrode from the outside in, right? We talked about this with oxidation. In this case, in this old gun, they did something called case hardening, where they exposed the iron in the gun, right, the steel or the iron in the gun, to extra carbon on the outside. What do we know about car steel when you add extra carbon to it? Does it get harder or softer? Harder. It becomes more like cast iron, right? If you add lots of carbon, it goes from low carbon steel to high carbon to eventually to cast irons. So by putting a bunch of carbon on this outer layer, the bulk of that gun, you know, or whatever you wanted to case harden, is still ductile and tough, but that surface is now hard and a little bit brittle, but you don't care because it's just a surface layer. So it's going to prevent scratching. It looks kind of cool, puts a cool patina on it. And so they do this all the time. You can imagine going in this example, I can't remember what they're carburizing, but as they change the conditions of the heat treatment when they introduce this carbon, you can end up with just a little bit to a whole bunch, right? And it's going to diffuse from the outside in. And we have e equations that tell us how far in it's going to go. We can quantify that, right? So maybe to get started on this chapter, I need a volunteer who's willing to risk life and limb for science in exchange for a t-shirt. Oh. Abby, you want to do it? All right, Abby, you're up. <laughs> I don't think we've ever done this to a girl, but there's a t first for everything. All right, Abby, we are going to spray you with Axe and get this dark temptation. So what I want you to do in this room is when you smell the dark temptation, I want you to raise your hand. Any second thoughts? I'm going to douse you. I do have a prize for someone who's willing to do it. OK. So <laughs> y'all just tell me when you can smell it. Give it a minute. <laughs> I tell you, I smell it <laughs> very strongly right now. <laughs> Slowly working its way backwards <laughs> as Abby inches further and further away. <laughs> People smelling it. OK. In the past, I've gone for like five minutes. I think we're going to stop this year. You're a good sport, Abby. Pick a shirt that fits you. OK, now, what was the trend that we observed? The trend that we observed is that the first people to smell it was myself and Abby. And then the first row, and it's slowly headed backwards, and you can start smelling it. Diffusion happens when you move down a concentration gradient. Those molecules that we smell that they put into that Axe body spray, they don't just on their own clump together in the room. They spread out because entropy. They want to spread out. So they're moving down the concentration gradient. Now, if this was diffusion, then it would be something like it's in a solid, where I put an impurity atom right here, and there's a bunch more on the surface, and that impurity is going to slowly hop its way through the room. Now, we smelt it, and it was diffusing meters at a time because it was actually convection, right? It's being carried by air currents through the room. But that idea of moving down the concentration gradient is an important one. That is so strong. Every year I forget how bad X smells. Um, the ability to diffuse is the reason why we get these structures. Right? This structure that you see here, the sort of what we've been calling the lamellar or the zebra type structure, why did it happen again? Because in the material, you've got the solid forming from the liquid, right? And if it's a material like gold, or what is this? This is gold and silicon. The end members that it forms 
are pure gold and pure silicon, but in the liquid they can be mixed, right? So your gold and your silicon atoms are mixed in the liquid state, but as soon as it goes through that eutectic transformation, they have to diffuse and separate into either pure gold or pure silicon. And because they can't diffuse infinitely fast, you end up with these stripes which are relatively small. So understanding diffusion will tell us how thick of those lamellas there are. And if they're thinner, it's going to be a harder, stronger material because it's just more grain boundaries. If they're thick, then it's going to be a weaker, more ductile material. Okay? All right, how about this? Okay, let's say I take copper and nickel bars, I heat them up for a long time, I weld them together, I put it in a furnace, what's going to happen to it? Intuitively. A copper and a nickel bar, similar materials, I weld them together and then I heat it up, what should happen? You've got pure copper, pure nickel, what's going to happen, Sam? They're going to mix. Yeah, they're going to mix. Imagine if I took like a bucket of red marbles and a bucket of white marbles and I stick them next to each other and I shake it, those red and white are going to diffuse, right? Your white marbles that started over here are going to move that way and red's going to do the opposite, right? So you can actually see that happening. The picture ends up looking a little bit something like this. If you had a nice, clean, perfect interface with pure materials on either side, they're going to diffuse one into another, right? And these curves that you get, we can calculate those if we understand the equations we're going to cover in this chapter. All right. Um, I think I like this diagram because it shows sort of what's happening in an actual material. If you look at this, there it is. Right, so they start out with atoms sitting at interstitial sites between the blue atoms, and the white atoms are more mobile than the blue atoms. They're actually vibrating. And you can see that while they started out clumped together on one side, because they're randomly oscillating in every random direction, there's still a net movement to the right. Now, why is that? Well, over here, if it tries to jump to the left, that spot was taken. But there was an empty spot to the right. So on average, all things equal, meaning it's vibrating in all directions without any bias, it's still going to move down the concentration gradient because one of your options is already filled to go back the other direction, right? So let's quantify this with some plots, OK? Let's start with, um, so there's a driving force for jumping. That's going to be our concentration gradient. So let's draw this. So we're going to have from position 1 over to position 2, the energy potential landscape might look something like this, where you've got N1 and N2. N means the concentration of some atom right, at some position. And if N1 is equal to N2, meaning they're the same concentration, then the rate at which you're going to jump from one spot to the other is going to be equal, right? The rate <clears throat> at which you jump from here to there and the rate at which you jump from here to there, dn1 dt, so that's the rate, right? dt is per time, is going to be equal to dn2 dt. There's no net flux here. If the concentration gradient is the same, these things are equal to one another. Everybody with me? Nevertheless, even though they're the same, there is still an activation energy. This um, distance right here that it has to overcome is its activation energy, right? So it, these things are going to be hopping happily from site one to two and back and forth, but the rate at which they can hop will be dictated by this activation energy. It still has to overcome that, right? The bigger the activation energy, the harder it is. And it's actually in an exponential, right? So the rate is equal to V times F. V is your attempt frequency. So it's the, it's the frequency at which your atoms are oscillating. They're, they're, they're rattling around, right? So you've got V, then you've got F is, your, is the fraction of atom atoms in a correct configuration. So in other words, let's say it's a nice square lattice we showed you before. If we're talking about going from site 1 to 2, that's moving this way, but maybe there were six directions possible. It could have gone up or down or in or out. Only one of those is going in the direction that we've defined here. So that's what F is. It's the fraction that's the correct jump. I just got to wonder the people that are walking in late, like, what's happening in this room? Why does it smell this way? And we won't tell them. Right? And then you've got this exponential of the negative activation energy divided by your thermal energy. So the bigger that activation energy, your jump frequency, your rate jumping from one side to the other, just gets killed if it's too big. Okay? Now what happens if there's a difference in the concentration? That changes things, right? So let's draw this again. From site 1 to site 2, let's assume that 
site 1 is much more concentrated. So N1, N1 is much greater than N2, okay? So N2 is down here now. If we plot this, it's going to look like this. Where hopping from site 1 to site 2, you still had to overcome that delta G, M, right? You still had that activation energy to overcome. Yeah, Abby? When you say hopping from site 1 to site 2, what are you So literally, if we looked at like these pictures, like these atoms are sort of, they rattle around, and every once in a while, they jump to a different site. That's what I mean by hopping. They literally move from this site here to, say, that site there. That, that interaction right there. We can quantify how often the rate at which that happens with these equations. Yeah, Lennon? What are the axes on those graphs? Great question. So x is going to be just position, right? <clears throat> so this is just called x. It's like your position. Whereas the y is an energy landscape. I should have drawn that. Thank you for catching that. y is the energy that you have to overcome in order to transition, right? And in this scenario, we're now the, oh yeah, go ahead, Jaden. Yep, we could define it either way. Okay. This position right here is, N, is position 1. So the concentration at position 1 is N1. Okay? We could define it either way, though. So if you go from N2 to N1? Absolutely. In fact, both of those phenomena are happening. So the rate at which you're going from N1 to N2 will not be the same as 2 going back to 1. How come? Well, because look at the energy landscape. This guy only had to overcome a small activation energy relative to the other direction. The other direction has to include this change, too. <clears throat> That's, we're going to write that as delta mu. That is, um, the gr it's related to the chemical potential. It's the change in the chemical potential. We'll remind you what that is in just a second. So going this way, your flux of atoms going that way, dn2 dt, is going to be small, because its activation energy is really big, whereas the rate going from 1 to 2 is going to be really large, right? dn1 dt is greater than dn2. And we've done the math here. Okay? You can see that the activation energy, which was small before, going from 1 to 2, is larger going from 2 to 1, because it has this additional term that we have to overcome, this, this chemical potential. What did chemical potential mean? Back in the chapter on phase diagram, we talked about it. The chemical potential is the energy change in a system as I add or remove a single atom. Right? So what is this whole group of students is like a lattice. If I remove one metric, Andrew? Yeah. Andrew. If I remove one metric Andrew, what does the energy of the system do? That's the chemical potential of Andrew in this lattice, right? Or if I try and stuff an extra Andrew into this lattice, that would also be the chemical potential. It's the energy change, right? So that's the perfect thing to measure here, because you're taking an atom from one site and putting it onto another. We need to know what the change in the chemical potential would be. That's what that little mu symbol is, delta mu, is the change in chemical potential. Okay? Now, I'm not going to expect you guys to know these equations uh, on an exam. I'm just showing you where these come from. Uh, in fact, I think I'm going to skip this for the sake of time. The, the point being that I, all I, I'm, going to take, I'm going to show you a simpler ones to use in a minute, but the point is that if you wanted to, you could calculate the flux. J is our flux. That's the amount of atoms that travel per area per time. You could calculate that from all these first principles things, from your thermal energy, from the difference in chemical potential, from this lambda term, which I've defined up above, um, which basically has to do with the geometry of your sample, and then lambda, right? So from first principles, you could calculate diffusion, and people do it. Yeah, question? Nope, I'll show you everything you need to know. It's simpler. <clears throat> I just want to show you basically where this is coming from. That from an atomistic perspective, they're moving down the concentration gradient. Okay. So the rules of thumb, if there's different types of diffusion. If we're talking about diffusion mechanisms where uh, this first scenario here, it's atomic motion from one position to another. It depends on a couple of scenarios. First. The adjacent site has to be empty. Right? If we go back to our drawing here, these things that want to jump next to each other, may, if that site's full, then it's not allowed to jump there, even if it has the energy for it. Like Those two can't exchange spots because it's a filled spot. It has to jump to an empty spot. The next thing is, it has to have enough energy to break the bonds with its current neighbors to jump to the next spot over. And only some fraction of your total number of atoms in their vibrational frequency are going to have that. So it's not like every single time it vibrates, it's going to make the jump, because it's a small percentage of the time that it has enough energy to actually get over that activation barrier. Okay? Now you've got different options. You can have vacancy diffusion, or you can have interstitial diffusion. What are we seeing here? 
This is... This is interstitial diffusion. The, the white atoms are moving through interstitial sites, sites that are all unoccupied, right? So they're free to just move that way. If it's vacancy diffusion, that's sort of like hopping through this room, empty seat to empty seat. So if Carlos moves over one seat into that empty seat, Abby could take that seat, Garrett could eventually hop over, right? It's all mediated by that vacancy moving through the lattice because most of the seats are filled. In an interstitial mechanism, most of them are empty, right? Those are the two differences between there. If it is vacancy, then we, it's interesting to think of that the atoms move one way, but the vacancies move the other direction. Okay. So which one is it most likely to be? It, it depends. Most of the time, interstitials aren't that big in a lattice. And if they're not that big, then your big atoms won't be able to travel that way. So for example, remember when we talked about fuel cells, like the, uh, the fuel injection engine, we said that was possible because oxygen ions can travel through the lattice. Oxygen is ginormous. It can only move on vacancies, when there's an empty seat, because it won't fit in the interstitials, whereas something like carbon or hydrogen can hop through interstitials. Carlos? So oh, yeah. Like oh, absolutely. All things diffuse. The rate at which they diffuse can be very different. For example, in polymers, you tend to get really high diffusion rates. This is why if you have a... Um, a glass bottle, like a, a styrofoam bottle, anybody, or a, a styrofoam cup, anybody did this in Scouts or something where you take an egg and you put it in a styrofoam cup, you put it in the fire and it doesn't burn? Did anybody do this? Was I the only one that did this? Yeah. Why does it not burn? Because the water wicks through the styrofoam because it's relatively permeable to water. That's either diffusion or permeation through pores, right? And then the water evaporates so it doesn't actually consume the styrofoam cup, it just keeps on sweating. Um, so polymers tend to like sweat, if you will. Like, they, they diffuse much more rapidly than other materials. And diffusion is sometimes we want it and sometimes we don't. Hydrogen embrittlement is a big problem with hydrogen fuel cells. Like we showed you the Toyota Mirai. The reason why, well, one of the reasons why those aren't as widespread used is we don't have a great way to store hydrogen. If you remember Elon Musk when they were talking about his star hopper or whatever he called it, spaceship that wants to go to Mars, he initially wanted to store the fuel, the gas fuel, right, in liquid state in these giant composite tanks, right? And then he ended up doing stainless steel. The problem with these is that hydrogen travels at different rates through composite versus steel, and it changes its properties. Think about it. What if this was all steel, right? So you've got already iron with carbon sitting in a bunch of your interstitials, so it's already unhappy because you've stuffed a bunch of extra carbon in it. Now what happens if I start to pour hydrogen into this? What do you think that's going to do to the properties? Will it get more ductile or less ductile? And to answer that question, ask yourself, is it easier for a dif dislocation to move through that material with a bunch of hydrogens crammed everywhere? No. A, a, a hydrogen is an impurity that has a strain field that pins your dislocations. So you get hydrogen embrittlement. So stainless, anytime you store hydrogen in anything, it embrittles it because it diffuses into it and makes it less ductile. And then you get bad fracture, right? OK, so what is the equation that I expect you guys to use is this one. Fixed first law. Jaden, you had a question? It was an easy choice. Um, com composites are better, but the scale, the size of the thing he's trying to make was ginormous. They make things that big. ATK, right? Now they're called Northrop Grumman Innovation Systems up in Plain City or whatever it is, or wherever, up in northern Utah. They have giant holders like that, but it's not easy. Making composites on that scale is not easy. But then you said you just like, get fracture. Yep, absolutely. <laughs> it risks brittle fracture. So we'll see how it turns out. Maybe he's, maybe he's sorted that out. OK? Um, so the first equation I, that you'll need to use in this class is for steady state conditions. What does steady state mean? Anybody encountered this term before? Have we talked about it yet? What does steady state mean? From the reading, anybody? Yeah. Yeah. It's not that there's no diffusion. It's that the rate of diffusion is constant. It's not changing, which means your boundary conditions aren't changing, right? What causes diffusion? A gradient in your concentration gradient, right, in your concentration profile. So if that's not changing, then the rate of diffusion won't change either. But let's assume that you have a fixed amount of material on one side, and as it diffuses through, that concentration goes down. Then you can no longer assume this steady state condition. And steady state's the easier one to calculate. Because look at the equation. The flux, and flux is always amount of something per area per time. So if you say like the Virgin River down in Zion, if you want to go canyoneering, the flux of water in that river has to be below something. They'll tell you that it's gallons or cubic feet per Right, area per time or something. That's going to be the flux of it. 
So here, the flux is given by negative d, that's our diffusion coefficient, multiplied by dc dx, where c is the concentration and x is the thickness of whatever it's diffusing through, right? So that dc dx, that's your gradient in your concentration. That's your concentration profile, right? That's going to lead to the driving force for this. And then the constant of proportionality, this is ultimately a linear expression, right? That's a linear relationship, is just d. And d is your diffusion coefficient. They have a negative sign because it travels down the diffusion, uh, the concentration gradient, OK? So let's, let's take a look at this. <clears throat> let's consider this scenario here. We're going to consider self-diffusion of alpha iron. So alpha is the, the phase of iron, right, at 500 C. Its diffusion coefficient is 3e to the negative 21 meters squared per second, right? The units are area per time, OK? If you consider that exact same material at that exact same time, but change the diffusing species to carbon, carbon's way smaller than iron. So self-interstitial is iron moving in an iron lattice, probably going to be hopping on vacancy sites. But carbon, which can occupy interstitial sites, look at this. It goes, and its diffusion coefficient is 2.4 e to the negative 12, nine orders of magnitude faster. Carbon is a billion times faster in diffusing through this than iron itself, right? So these things can be wildly, wildly different, and temperature plays a major role. The reason why is because our, our diffusion coefficient itself, d, is what we call a thermally activated equation. We've seen these all semester, where there's a pre-exponential, in this case d naught, multiplying it by an exponential with an activation energy, the negative qd. qd is our activation energy for diffusion, divided by the thermal energy, rt or kbt, depending on if you're talking about per moles or per atoms. Okay. So that is uh, this expression. Let's do an example, right? So you would literally plug in your temperature, your activation energy, your pre-exponential. You could solve for this d value. You could plug it into there. And if you knew the concentration difference across your material and how thick that was, you could calculate the flux of atoms diffusing through your material arbitrarily, assuming fixed first law holes, which is steady state conditions, OK? So here's our first clicker question, I think, for the day. Let's start with this one. Hope this one's clear by now. Just get your brains working. Which mechanism is faster? Is it going to be vacancy or interstitial? Which diffusion mechanism ought to be faster, vacancy or interstitial? Okay, get your answers in. This one's easy peasy. <clears throat> okay, we're going to close the poll. Okay, people think hopefully the correct answer here. Yeah, well, actually, that's surprising. It is interstitial. Why is it faster? Who, th who wants to explain why interstitial ought to be faster? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. If we went back to like the mathematical reason why this is the case, is this J term? It's not just the rate at which it hops. It has this geometry factor, which takes into account how many empty sites are there. And if we're assuming a simple cubic lattice, it's one out of six sends you the right direction. You have to multiply that by the odds of it being filled with a vacancy in the vacancy model. So diffusion is just really much slower via vacancy. Interstitial also typically tends to be smaller atoms, right? Because interstitial sites tend to be smaller. As a smaller atom, like imagine like a cat trying to climb through these feet, like walking through the middle of this row. Cat's pretty small. It's not going to bother your feet too much as it moves through. Now imagine like my big goofy like labradoodle is going to like clobber its way through there because it's going to push feet more out of the way. It's going to be slower, OK? All right, let's do our next question. Um, let's, let's start this one, OK? Uh, these are out of order. Sorry about that. <clears throat> 
All right, hold that thought on this one. So how about this? We won't do a clicker question on it. I had it out of order. But the question is, is there a temperature at which copper atoms in pure copper are going to diffuse at the same rate as zinc atoms in brass? And you've got the information here. So let's set this one up and try it, right? To set this one up, the rate, since we're after the rate, the, the, the rate at which they will diffuse, remember d equals d naught, this pre-exponential, multiplied by the exponential of negative activation energy over kb or rt. Since these are given on a per mole basis, we're going to use rt, not kbt. OK? So the question is, is there a temperature at which these things are going to equal one another? So we're going to try and set two equations equal to one another and see if it can be solved for a single temperature. That's as simple as this is, OK? So the first one, it says copper in pure copper. So notice right here, this says d naught copper in copper. So that's the pre-exponential for copper moving in a copper lattice. So it's going to be 7.8 e to the negative 5 meters squared per second times the exponential of negative 211. That's kilojoules, so I would convert it to joules. 1,000 joules per mole over R, which we know gas constant is going to be 8.3144. That's joules per mole Kelvin multiplied by some temperature, right? You're going to set that equal to zinc atoms moving in brass. Right down here, the second one right here says D naught for zinc in copper. Copper and zinc mixture, that is brass. So zinc and copper, that's, that's what we're using there. And this would be equal to 2.4 e to the negative 5 meters squared per second exponential of negative 189,000 joules, 8.3144 joules per mole Kelvin. That's per mole times temperature. You could set these equal to each other. And if these equations, if these two lines right, intersect at a point, a temperature value, then this would be correct, right? Then there is a temperature at which they have the same diffusion rate. If they never intersect those lines, then there's no temperature, right? Any questions on this? Very simple test style question from this chapter. Any questions on how you'd set this up? You had to know two things. For each material that was hopping, you had to know the pre-exponential and the activation energy. And then you just solve for T in this case, OK? Before we do the uh, clicker question on the screen, let's set this one up now. This is, a very, uh, this is a much more common approach for an engineering question when it comes to diffusion. It says the following. Consider a material that's going to separate gas. Okay, So you've got <clears throat> this scenario. We're going to plot your partial pressure of gas, let's say hydrogen. Okay, Then this x-axis is going to be some separation distance. So at some point. We'll call this XA and XB. This is your material. When they do this for hydrogen purification, where do they get hydrogen from? They get it from lots of places. But it might be from methane. If you have a methane well, if they're doing fracking, for example, and you want to separate the methane from the other gases, you might use a semi-permeable membrane where the gas travels easily through the membrane if it's one type of gas, but it's slow for another. Hydrogen's tiny, so it's going to travel through palladium metal much faster than methane, and actually do this, right? So the flow of hydrogen is going to be this way if the concentration on one side is higher than the other. So we'll call that PA and PB. So these, in both cases, it's the solubility of hydrogen in the palladium. The partial pressure over here, we'll call this region 1, and the partial pressure of region 2, this must be lower than the partial pressure of region 1. In other words, hydrogen doesn't really want to dissolve into the metal very badly, but it's going to dissolve more if it's at a higher pressure on this side. So this would be like your gas, your, your well bore, right? This is where the, the mixture of things is. We've got methane and hydrogen and whatever else. And over here is where you're trying to collect the pure hydrogen. You have to have a difference in, in the concentration, right? So this is your solubility of hydrogen on the two different pressures. And what you see is that if it's under steady state conditions, and that's the key word here, the concentration profile of hydrogen dissolved into your metal linearly changes. It's not the same everywhere. 
as long as there's a difference in your partial pressure of hydrogen on either side, there is a concentration profile where there's lots of hydrogen dissolved over here and little over here because you keep on taking it away. OK? Abby? Okay. If you had a piece of iron and you want the concentration to be equal, sorry, ask your question one more time. Oh, if the concentration is the same, then there will be no net diffusion because there's no driving force. Or in other words, the rate at which carbon hops this way will equal the same rate at which it hops that way. So there's no net diffusion. You have to have a gradient in your concentration. It has to be a difference on the two sides in order to have a net flux from one side to the other. Sam? Or did you? Yeah. Oh, so why do you want to do this? So when you, when you do fracking or whatever, um, you might have hydrogen sulfide. That poisons natural gas. They call it uh, a sour well has hydrogen sulfide, right? You don't want to burn that. I don't remember the reason why I think it's toxic, but it also damages components. So you'd love to separate the methane which you want from the hydrogen sulfide which you don't want. And a semi-permeable membrane where methane travels through it but not very fast, but hydrogen sulfide travels through it really fast, that's a great thing. Or if you're recovering hydrogen or helium, this is how they get helium actually, it was also from these wells, that's how they get helium. Helium travels through these things way faster than methane so they can separate the helium so we can give it to kids on Halloween, which is crazy because it's a non-renewable resource. Yeah, Sam? Yep. Like the one with the higher partial pressure is going to have some means of maintaining that yep. pressure. Yep, that's right. It means that these, yeah, the pressures, it's happening in, in a process where the pressures overall are not changing. So as you remove hydrogen that, di that diffuses through, you introduce new hydrogen, okay. right? So it's, it's staying constant. Because it's staying constant, the rate of diffusion will also stay constant. We'll always stay five and three. It will always stay at five and three. Yep. Okay, so it's not like it diffuses across and that side gets higher and the point of the five gets lower. Nope. We're assuming that the boundary conditions stay constant. As we take hydrogen away, we're adding more and it just keeps on diffusing through so it's not changing with time. We'll show you what it does when we change it with time in a minute. It's it's nastier. So the slope of this line, that is D C D X. That is our concentration profile, right? You could calculate that CA minus CB over XA minus XB. You can do it either way. You can also do CB minus CA over XB minus XA. Doesn't matter. It will give you the same value. Okay. So for this one, to figure out then the flux of hydrogen going through this palladium sheet, now that we know the concentration profile, assuming that we could know that, the only thing we need to know to figure out the flux is the diffusion constant, right? We needed that D because J equals negative D DC DX. So we know DC DX, if you know how thick your thing is and what the dissolved gas concentration is on, on the two surfaces. And D, you just look it up in a table. You'd say, okay, great, we're talking about carbon going through alpha iron or aluminum going through aluminum or whatever it may be. You can look up tables of these things. There's some in the book and there's others that you can find in the scientific literature, okay? So the good news is that Lots of these things have been calculated. We benefit by living in the year 2019 and that lots of this fundamental work has already been done for us. So we can just use it. It becomes really uh, a matter of plugging into a simple equation for us. So the question, the clicker question you're faced with is the following. It says, you're working at Intec and your job is to harden titanium through the diffusion of carbon. Okay? You're going to try and introduce carbon into titanium. It says, the concentration of carbon one millimeter into the surface is something. It's some number per volume, right? So that's a concentration. It's mass per volume there. But three millimeters into the surface, it's a different value. It's 0.25 kilograms per meter cubed. So there's two different concentrations. It says the temperature of the carburizing environment is given. Notice that's in Celsius. And the rate at which the carbon is entering this two millimeter thick region is also given. What is the diffusion coefficient? So let's set this question up. <clears throat> so if this is the surface over here, and this is carbon concentration, one millimeter into the sample, right there, versus three millimeters into the sample is right there. We know the concentration at those points. 
right? Those are given. That's this one right there, and this one right there. If we assume that this is fixed first law, so it's steady state diffusion, then that's going to be a linear relationship there, right? That dc dx is a straight line between those. And the other piece of information that we are given is the total flux through that region, through this two millimeter thick region, is given as 1.27 e to the negative 9 kilograms squared, uh, kilograms per meter squared per second, okay? So we're given the flux, we're given the concentration, we're asked to solve for the diffusion coefficient. So easy peasy, let's set this up. J equals negative D dc dx, where we know J is 1.27 times 10 to the negative 9, that's kilograms per meter squared per second equals negative D, which we don't know we're solving for, multiplied by the difference in concentration. So that's going to be 0 0.68 minus uh, 0 0.25 over, that's going to be 1 minus 3. Those are in millimeters, so I'm going to switch those to meters so our units don't get messed up. It's going to be 0 0.001 minus 0 0.003. That will have the units of kilograms per meters to the fourth. Everybody see that? Any questions? So just look at the unit analysis. What must be the units of D in order to have this side of the equation, kilograms per meter squared second equal kilograms per meter to the fourth over here? D must be meter squared per second to get the right units. Okay? So if you plug things in here, you should get D with the units of meter squared per second. So go ahead and plug those in. That's our clicker question right here. You're going to type in the answer, just some number, and that will be e to the negative 12th meters per squared per second. So just type in the number. Don't type in e to the negative 12th or anything. Gosh, this stinks so bad. So strong. Oh my gosh, it's so strong right there. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that is such a good idea. It's so evil. the whole building. Your brother's an evil genius. He needs to use his powers for good. Oh, he's on the receiving end. Okay, so get your answers in another minute. <clears throat> this is pretty straightforward. Yeah. Sig figs? It doesn't matter. I do a range instead of sig figs. I always do like plus or minus 5% is the right answer or something. Sorry, Emma, that smell is so strong. Oh, I'm sorry. I should ask that next time. I will do that next class that I do this. Okay, I'm going to close the poll. Looks like most of the answers are in. Notice in this question, we didn't actually need the temperature either. That was a red herring on it. Okay. Okay, only a quarter of people got that one correct. So what went wrong here? Let's plug this in and actually get it. So somebody tell me what is in this equation over here. 0.68 minus 0.25 over that value, what is that equal to? What is it? 215. And when you take 1.27 and divide that, e to the negative 9 divided by 215, what do you get? That should be negative. Otherwise, we're going to have a negative problem. 0.25.
So 1.27 e to the negative 9 divided by negative 215, what does that come out to? Somebody? 5? So it should be, OK, when we solve for d, it should be 5.9 times 10 to the negative 12. And that should have the units of meters squared per second. OK? Are there questions on this? This is actually, believe it or not, the simpler one of the two. Yeah. Yep. Oh, yep. <clears throat> Sig figs shouldn't matter. I always do plus or minus 5%. I'll, do, I'll double check. Maybe I didn't on this one, so I'll, I'll go back and look at that. OK, the point is that fixed first law is actually the easier of the two to calculate, because we're making the assumption that the boundary conditions don't change. That leads to a linear profile. If that's not the case, we have to do a much harder thing, right? Non-steady state condition is right here, right? So in this one, at time t equals 0, maybe there's no diffusion. And so a few minutes in, maybe the profile looks like that, where far deep into the sample, it's 0. You haven't diffused anything. But at the surface, you have lots of it. And it takes a long time before it goes from this to that. This starts looking like the steady state solution after long periods of time. But there's all these regions in between where it's this sort of exponentially looking thing. So we need a different mathematical model. When you guys take, um, when you take what do you call it, uh, PDEs, you'll learn how to solve these things. We're just going to use a pre-existing solution in this class. We're not going to solve the PDE in this class. So this is fixed second law, where we're looking at the change in the concentration gradient with time, dc dt, as it changes spatially with position. That's the second derivative, d squared c dx squared, right? So there's a reason why you're taking PDEs. This actually turns out to be useful for solving engineering problems. But in this class, since we have, it's not a prereq, we're going to just use a pre-existing solution to it. Okay? And the solution makes a lot of assumptions. It assumes that you're starting with something on the surface and that the concentration at the surface is not changing. So there's an infinite amount of material at the surface of whatever's diffusing in, right? so that concentration won't change. It's assuming that the concentration deep within your sample is fixed at some point, and you have a big sample. So they call this a semi-infinite solution sometimes, because it assumes a semi-infinite body. So this won't work if you're doing carbon into tinfoil, because tinfoil is super thin. But a carbon into a big block of aluminum, this will be a much better solution for. Okay? And here's the solution. The solution says the composition, the concentration, at position x, we can solve for that if we plug in these different things, where C0 is the concentration deep within the sample, Cs is the concentration at the surface, ERF stands for the error function, which is a mathematical tool that gives us the shape that we're looking for. And then you've got x, your position, divided by 2 square root of dt, where d is your diffusion coefficient, and t is time. Okay? So we could, I could arbitrarily ask, at, after 15 minutes of the diffusion experiment, what is the concentration profile 1 millimeter into your sample? And you'd say, all right, great. 15 minutes, I plug in time. You've got 15 minutes, turn that into seconds. Plug in the diffusion coefficient, plug in 1 millimeter, plug in your surface and your initial, and you could solve for Cx, right? This is straightforward. Now, how do you use this error function? Here's a table, and a common way is, let's say that like the error function that you need, you need to know the error function of 0.33. And so you look in your table and you say, well, shoot, I don't have it for 0.33. I have it for 0.3 and for 0.35. So what do you do? You can do a linear interpolation between these points. So the equation for that is pretty straightforward. Pull it up. If you have something that's between two points, the equation to figure out is going to be y minus y naught over x minus x naught equals y1 minus y naught over x1 minus x naught. Well, let's say that this is um, x, and that's y, and this is 0, and that's 1. Okay. So if you have some value, let's say the error function of 0.33 you wanted to solve for, well, error function, that's our, uh, the point three three would be z in this table, right? So we're trying to solve for when z, which our x value is 0.33. So let's write this out. We're trying to solve for y minus the value below it, right? This is the 0, and that's the 1 column. So that's going to be 0 0.3286. Oops. 
divided by 0 0.33 minus the value below it, which is um, 0 0.3. This will be equal to 0 0.3794 minus 0 0.3286 divided by 0 0.35 minus 0 0.3. So it's not like the nicest thing ever, but it's not that hard to do. Yeah, Abby? Yeah, good question. Let me show you what a, an error function actually looks like. OK, the error function looks like the following. It is a mathematical expression that comes from an integral that we're not going to do. Instead, we're going to use a table, a tabulated value of what it looks like. And it looks like this. It looks like a diffusion profile. I don't know why that's showing up as white, black. In any case, it looks kind of like what we observe uh, and so that's the whole point of this. You could solve this analytically, but that's a really nasty expression. So they were nice and they said, oh, turns out diffusion profiles kind of look like that. So we can use the error function as an approximate shape instead, right? Which makes it easier for us. The, the issue is that Google, if I put in like the error function of 0 0.33, it can spit it out and it'll tell us. Use some tool. Google let me down. Right? I can punch in 0 0.33, and it will calculate the, oh, come on. <laughs> All right, I will pause it on your site. Right? Not now, thank you. Good catch. Right, and that will tell us the error function. But on your, on your test, you're not going to be able to do that unless your calculator can do error function for you. So instead, you need to be able, for any arbitrary value, spit out what that error function is. Okay? So... Quick note, we are, I'll say a few more words about this probably in a separate video. I'll record this after class and add on five minutes to it. On Monday, I won't be here. I have to go to Idaho National Labs. So Danny will be here, and she'll do examples. And I will pre-record chapter 17. The good news is that chapter 17 is on thermal transport, and it's the exact same math. Fixed first law and second law are the exact same for heat transfer. So I'll just talk about the other differences in that video. What's that? Yeah, I'll make, a, I'll make a Canvas announcement about that. I'll have the study guide up this weekend. In the thermal transport? I do. I go over them. Yeah. One second. Let me pause this. OK, so we can go ahead and solve this. The right-hand side of the equation is going to be 0.3794 minus 0.3286. Divide that by 0 0.05. Now we're going to multiply that by 0.33 minus 0 0.3. And then we add to that 0.3286. So why? y is equal to the error function of 0 0.33 is equal to 0 0.359. Okay, so a big caution on this next point. Sometimes you'll hear people talk about a general diffusion distance. I'm going to say caution. This is not something you should use often unless people are saying specifically general diffusion distance. Where is this coming from? When x equals square root of dt, you can think of that as sort of like an average diffusion distance. You had error function of x over 2 square root of dt. So <clears throat> if you plug in square root of dt for x, then this becomes error function of 1 half. What does that equal? Right here, if you plug in 1 half, that means that as it should have gone all the way from this negative 1 up to positive 1, you're basically most of the way there. That's why they call this an approximate or an average diffusion distance. You're either halfway from 0 to 1 or all the way across. So this is the typical solution for diffusion. You're basically halfway there. You're essentially halfway there. So use that as a caution, OK? <clears throat> and we have an example where you'd use that.
Okay, how about this one? Here we're going to use Fick's second law for diffusion. The question states the following. Boron is pre-deposited at 4.5 times 10 to the 20 atoms per centimeter cube. So that's a concentration on a silicon wafer with initial concentration also given. The conditions are 30 minutes at 1223K and the D diffusion coefficient is given. It says calculate the concentration at the diffusion length. So at the diffusion length, that's when x equals square root of dt. Okay, x equals square root of dt. Okay, now the composition at x, at that position, is going to be cx minus c naught, cs minus c naught, equals 1 minus the error function <coughs> of x, which is just square root of dt. We were told in this problem, specifically in this problem, that is not generally the case. That's specific to this problem, times 2 square root of dt, right? That allows us to let these things cancel and it's just error function of one half, okay? Error function of one half, we can look up in our table. The error function of one half, we're gonna have to use this interpolation, or no, z is one half, sorry, 0.5. So the error function of one half is gonna be 0 0.5205. So this is minus 0 0.5205. Okay, so Cx, the thing we're trying to solve for, is equal to the initial concentration, 5e to the 15, over 4.5e to the 20th, minus 5e to the 15. When we solve for Cx, we see that Cx is equal to 2.15 times 10 to the 20th atoms per centimeter cubed. So that's an example of how you'd use fixed second law for diffusion. And the key thing here is that <clears throat> they told you that x, the diffusion length, well, x was the diffusion length, but that could have just as easily been one millimeter or 10 millimeters or anything else, and we would have come up with a different error function rather than the one that we got for, okay? The last thing to talk about in this chapter is that there's something called short circuit diffusion pathways. So the slowest way to move through a material when you're diffusing is to go through the volume. If you look at the diffusivity on the y-axis versus one divided by temperature, so over here is hot and over here is cold, all things get better when you heat them up because diffusion, remember, is a thermally activated process. You've got negative activation energy for diffusion over your thermal energy. So as you heat things up, this gets better and better. But going through the volume, through the bulk, is the slowest possible. It's much faster to go along grain boundaries or along the surface. And think about why that is. If you move along the grain boundary, there's more open space. The surface has lots of open space. And so there's just better pathways for moving. If you go through the bulk, then there's it's a harder process, so it's going to be slower. Okay. In general speaking, we would say that you expect to see faster diffusion for open crystal structures. So if your structure is more open, that's going to be better. If you melt at a lower temperature, you're going to move faster through it. If it's secondary bonding, like polymers, it's faster. If your diffusing atom is smaller, cations and low density materials. And the opposite is true um, for slower diffusion. Close pack structures, high melting, covalent bonding, big atoms, high density, that's all going to be, tend to be slower. Okay. Diffusion in ionic materials is interesting because if you have, let's say you have diffusion of oxygen 2 minus species, that ion as it moves through the material, you're going to build up negative charge over here, right? So in order to fix this, you either need to send negative charge that way by sending electrons. That's what happens in a fuel cell. You have oxygen transporting and you have electrical transport going through the battery or <clears throat> through your vehicle, for example. Or you also have to take something like a positively charged ion and it has to travel as well so that you have positive and negative traveling through so it's charge balanced, okay? Generally speaking in diffusion uh, with polymers, polymers diffuse at a high rate, we've talked about that. Um, it can cause swelling and stretching that can cause to mechanical and physical degradation over time. Um, and then diffusion in liquids and glasses Essentially, it depends strongly on the temperature that you're at. So let's consider this scenario where you've got your, this is the melting point divided by the temperature that you're at. So right here, that would be your melting point. Okay. 
And then if you were to plot the log of your diffusion coefficient, it would look something like this, where you have maybe something on the order of 10 to the negative 4. This is maybe in centimeters squared per second, just to put numbers on it. And then down here, at your glassy transition temperature, you might have something like 10 to the negative 16. So a glass can have huge variation in your diffusion depending on the temperature that you're at. This is where you're a glass. And over here, you're at a liquid. So this would be, that's not your melting point, excuse me. Your melting, this would be hot over here, and this would be your glassy transition temperature. Okay, so that's it for chapter six. I'll put up the uh, video for chapter 17. You can watch that before Monday, and a TA will be there to go through some example problems.